इट्स लाइव संजय great thank you uh, good morning everybody uh, happy sunday morning to all of you uh, thanks for joining for all those who've joined and even though we cannot see you we can feel you and you can hear us and uh, we'll be happy to take your questions uh, as we normally do uh, during the chat so you know uh, typically we end up meeting at the time of crisis is when you know there are waves going on there's a lot of activity going on and uh, it's good for once that we're meeting at a time when the wave appears like it's subsiding and uh, we're all keeping our fingers crossed and hope that there's going to be no further waves however irrespective of whether the wave uh, another wave comes or not there is another a uh, factor that we are dealing with which is we are observing and, and the incidence of this has been significantly higher in this third wave with a lot of people having residual symptoms uh, that is being coined as long covid so the agenda of today is really to discuss what exactly is long covid um uh, dr sachin bajaj will share some insights from his personal experience and provide some guidance and at the same time we'd also like to share with you uh, what step one is going to do and why we are vested in this uh, long covid uh, over to you sachin thank you very much uh, sanjeev uh, thank you very much to all of you uh, the current uh, uh, volunteers at project step one as well as people who are logging in for the very first time to come and volunteer uh, uh thank you very much for sparing your time on this wonderful sunny sunday morning uh, i am sure you all want to be outside and enjoy the sun but uh, we will make it as quick as possible and uh, of course we'll try and answer all your questions on this so uh, sanjeev if you if you could have the slides on please could you share your screen and is the slide visible sachin yeah could you go to slide 1 please yep i'm i am on slide 1 okay so my screen is frozen i think because i am seeing slide 12 uh let me stop sharing and reshare yeah that would be good now yes thank you very much yeah so uh, we'll start with the uh, introductions about what exactly is project step 1 so uh, most of you who are volunteering with project step 1 would know uh, that we are an entirely volunteer driven organization uh, we do not have any office bearers or any physical office nobody draws a salary so it is one of the world's largest volunteer led organization where everyone uh is a volunteer we are all volunteers here and we have more than uh, approximately 10000 doctors volunteering with us uh, many paramedical volunteers like nurses and medical students uh, citizen counselors and as well as a large team of uh, uh, cognizant citizens who come and help us out with the logistics technology back end work and our mission is to blend technology and human resources together to provide healthcare access to those who need it the most uh, we always work in coordination with government authorities to verify patient details and assist them in handling the large volumes of covid patients you can think of us as a digital charitable healthcare organization like you have charitable hospitals charitable clinics uh, which provide free of cost care so you can think of us as a digital charitable healthcare organization where everything is free uh, of cost to both the patients as well as the governments that we work with next slide please so how do we help the healthcare system so yesterday we were reviewing some data and uh, we've made more than 9.6 million Uh, tele consultations uh, since last year when the pandemic started since july 2020 so that's a humongous number and it's all due to you people who have been out there calling patients uh, covid as we know is when the waves do come in they come in really fast and really high 
and uh, uh, we need to quarantine the super spreaders uh, we need to track the health of home quarantined and home isolated patients uh, to make sure that there are no deaths at home uh, at least you know we we care for the people who are sick and uh, if you are fine then you don't need to actually go to the hospital so we manage both ends of the spectrum people who need to be in hospital should be in hospital but people who are fine should not unnecessarily clog hospital bed so uh, there's this big uh, talk about how delhi reduced home isolation deaths to zero in the second wave and uh, of course we all were a big part of that uh, to manage the entire home isolation system including access to ambulances in emergencies and uh, hospital beds uh, when needed so uh, we work mostly with volunteers of course but technology plays a big part in this and we try and automate as many processes as possible to make sure that uh, the manual work and the effort needed is as low as possible on all our parts next please so what exactly are we doing so we have this huge technology platform at the center of this entire process and then we have doctors and citizen volunteers and paramedics working on that platform and the platform has solid processes and systems set up for specific areas where the governments have asked us for their help so like when we started out in karnataka we had mostly incoming call centers people calling in to see you know whether they were suffering from covid or not what was uh, symptoms like whether it was a common cold or covid but when we started out in delhi the government wanted us to call out people rather than just managing a incoming helpline because they understood that you know people were becoming panicky or or super spreaders both ends of the spectrum some positives were not at all bothered they were roaming around going to the markets everything whereas some asymptomatic positives were so panicked that they went and blocked hospital beds immediately and in fact even icu beds so uh, we used to call all out of them and triage them for the hospital the good part about being virtual is that we can scale up very fast we have flexible lines uh, our virtual call centers can go from say 10 calls a day to 10000 calls a day very very quickly in fact almost instantly we don't need to add more seats or more phone machines or you know desktops or something like that so being virtual is something that's very good for us and agility is something that uh, we have a uh, i think a big hold on next slide please so we all understand from the last two years of the pandemic that covid is a multi systemic disease it's not just affecting the lungs uh, or the upper respiratory system it affects many organs and symptom systems especially uh, respiratory system circulatory system even the neurology symptoms in long covid are uh, for uh, there to all of us to see so and it can leave long term or sometimes even permanent equally in these and other organs and systems so covid uh, virus has been isolated in uh, uh, organs as far away as the kidney and the brain even 6 months after infection and uh, it's not usually correlated to the severity of the system uh, symptoms or the severity of the disease so isolation of virus can be detected even after months together even in a very mildly symptomatic patient so we do understand that it's affecting the entire body but how will the entire long term effects pan out we still have to see we are seeing a lot of symptoms uh, in the long term but we need to see what will happen in the coming years together on these uh, uh, long term sequelae that we are seeing and of course we get so many of these um, you know uh, patients who don't really understand what's going on and the frustrating part is that their relatives even their gps are not really understanding what exactly is going on uh people say that you know it's a minor variant now nothing is happening just you know enjoy yourself but uh, for many many patients it's completely wrecked their lives uh long covid has really affected their quality of life i have a patient who himself is a pediatrician 
and he used to play cricket early on very regularly he was very active uh, but he got uh, covid it was not very severe he didn't need to be hospitalized but now uh, he has inappropriate sinus tachycardia and it's very severe so even when he gets up to go to the bathroom uh, his heart rate shoots up to 180 185 even 190 sometimes and he gets severe palpitation and he has to sit down uh, even you know while walking from his bedroom to his bathroom so it's completely uh, you know destroyed his quality of life he can't go to the clinic he can't see his patients and uh, it's it's very tough for him and even though uh, it was an omicron variant uh, very mild disease when he got it but the sequelae are really damaging for him he doesn't really understand now how long will it take for him to recover what will happen and most of his uh, doctor friends also didn't understand that but when he came to us uh, that is when we started his uh, treatment and now of course he is much better symptomatically but the pathophysiology behind this is something that we still need to work a lot on so why are we doing this right uh, uh, it's as i said for the people who have been affected by it it's a huge deal it's a very big deal for them as i gave you the example of a pediatrician uh, because his quality of life is so bad now that he is wondering what uh, he has to do to get back on track so but the problem is generally the focus on covid has diminished and it is continuously diminishing with governments removing all curbs uh, you will see media coverage coming down and people saying it's just a mild variant so the focus will go away and unfortunately even now there is no focus of the government on long covid in india we had one long covid clinic being inaugurated in delhi by the delhi government uh, but that's about it it's also not functioning very uh, effectively even now uh, not seeing a lot of patients but other states and other governments have not actually recognized long covid as i said the disease mechanisms and the pathophysiology behind it is something that we still need to work a lot on we don't really understand exactly what's going on and uh, there are no evidence-based guidelines for management somebody is giving steroids somebody is giving beta blockers somebody is uh, going for psychological counseling so uh, it's not really clear uh, what happens if you get a long covid patient depending on the sim symptoms what exactly are the guidelines for management and that is why patients are willing to try anything they will go for ayurveda they will go for nat naturopathy they will go for um, psychological counseling as i said some of them so they are willing to try anything and take medication based on their own uh, experience or some of their friends telling them that oh this helped me so you should take this so it's a hugely dangerous situation where people don't really understand the doctors don't have clear understanding the government has no clear guidelines so patients are pretty much uh, fending for themselves and you know they don't really understand what's going on and uh, as i said it's a huge impact on the physical and emotional well-being and productivity of course go completely goes for a toss as i told you about the pediatrician he can't go see his patients he can't go to the clinic he can't even go out of his bedroom uh, so uh, young people having that uh, is a huge dent on the productivity of the entire system so this is the reason we are uh, working to uh, actually identify what is happening and get some data in uh, to make sure that you know we can work uh, with this uh, we know very little but what do we know till now is is not uh, very minuscule unlike what was the case when the pandemic hit us uh, in you may remember that the first guideline of who when the pandemic hit uh, in December in China and in January when the first guidelines started to come out the first guideline of WHO was you should not wear masks so uh, mask was not uh, indicated in fact WHO said nobody should wear masks it's not effective so this is where we've come to from the fact that earlier on we had very little idea of what was going on um, so right now we know that the immune system creates a cytokine storm to, as a reaction to the virus and uh, this 
uh, when the virus is multiplying a lot it reduces uh, the uh, you know effectiveness of this immune system the immune system is in a storm so it is actually fully uh, forcing its way to the virus but it's now uh, letting go of the other immune functions so you get more super added infections like we saw the dreaded mucormycosis coming in after the second hit and the uh, cytokine storm as well as the uh, large number of virus particles affect uh, the lungs, the kidneys, the livers, the digestive system. In this wave, particularly, uh, we saw a lot of patients coming in with digestive symptoms uh, like gastroenteritis, like loose motions, like uh, tummy aches, which have been lasting for weeks together. Uh, I have, I think, around 50, 55 patients uh, with pain abdomen being the prominent symptom and lasting for around two to three weeks. And uh, no medication was really effective. Uh, on that uh, pain abdomen, no antispasmodics, no painkillers could really get rid of that pain abdomen. Uh, after they had loose motions for the first two, three days, then the loose motion subsided, but the pain abdomen did persist for a very long time. So this, uh, we've seen that uh, this is the pathophysiology goes to various, various, uh, uh, you know, organ systems. So, but most of the patients uh, will recover in two to six weeks. Uh, approximately 10 to 15 percent of the patients progress to severe or moderate disease uh, where they do need hospitalization and about five percent uh, become critically ill with need for intensive care and this of course is for the delta variant with omicron variant this number came down to around one to 1.5 percent and uh, who were needing uh, hospitalization and critical care and of course, then after that, two to six weeks is the recovery period. But uh, what is exactly long COVID when the symptoms persist for more than this time, uh, then we do label it as a long COVID uh, case or a, a post acute uh, systemic COVID case, uh, PSC as we call it. So these are the long term effects uh, of COVID. 80% uh, of the long COVID patients have at least one of these symptoms. Uh, the predominant symptoms, of course, as we see, are fatigue, uh, breathlessness, inappropriate sinus tachycardia, persistent nausea, uh, headaches are very, very common. Uh, in, uh, you know, brain fogging, 16% of the patients are reporting uh, memory loss, 13% anxiety, 12% depression. Uh, people may have persistent fever. I have had a few patients with fever lasting for as long as a month uh, after, uh, you know, the six weeks period. So total of around 10 to 12 weeks. Uh, so dyspnea, breathlessness, chest congestion, chest discomfort are other symptoms. Uh, joint pains are now coming up in a big way. And as I said, digestive symptoms in terms of loose motions, pain abdomen, etc. are also coming in. Uh, weight loss has also been seen in some patients, uh, increase in sweating, anxiety, palpitation, all of these are very, very common symptoms that we see uh, in long COVID patients. Next slide, please. Uh, Sanjeev, the slide is frozen again. I don't know. Are you seeing the next slide on your screen? Yeah, okay. Yeah, slight so delay, I think. Sorry about that. The thing is now, how can we predict uh, long COVID? Can we really predict it that this patient will go into long COVID or this patient will not? So usually not. Uh, we don't usually uh, know, but we do know uh, according to some data results now coming in. Uh, this uh, is from the International Journal of General, General Medicine that older age groups, uh, uh, you know, people with underlying comorbidities like diabetes, hypertension, obesity, cardiovascular disease, smoking. Did we lose you, Sachin? Vishal, can you hear me? Uh, I think I've lost network. 
Sanjeev, can you see me? I can see you. Are you able to hear me? Now I can, wow. but I can't see. Actually, I've lost the screen completely. I can't see anything on the screen right I'll now. stop sharing and I'll, I'll reshare. Um, uh, Suchin, will that help? No, Vishal? No, I, can't, I can't see the... Uh, I can see your uh, screen sharing. No, no. Yeah, sorry. I couldn't. I My screen went completely blank. So I thought I had left the meeting, but I was there. Sorry. Uh, I couldn't see the Zoom screen at all. My laptop went completely blank. So, sorry about that. So, uh, yeah, sorry. Coming back. So, uh, older age groups and people with underlying comorbidities, uh, you know, especially diabetes, hypertension, and obesity, but also cardiovascular diseases, people who have been smoking, people who are alcoholics, uh, are people at high risk. And then once they do get, uh, and they are, of course, high risk for uh, severe COVID as well. And when they are suffering from COVID, if they have very severely abnormal lab results like uh, severe lymphopenia or thrombocytopenia, an elevated D-dimer, LDH, troponin, elevated CRP, ferritin, IL-6 and deranged coagulation profiles. Also, if they were on ventilation or uh, had to stay in ICU and uh, if they had more than five symptoms during the first week of infection, uh, especially if you had super added infection after that, uh, these were the people who were seen to be at higher risk for developing long COVID. And uh, this data was also supported by the REACT study. Uh, next slide, please. So this was a REACT study that had more than 30,000 patients uh, conducted by the Imperial College of London. So out of the 30,000 people enrolled in this study, more about 12,000 uh, or 40 percent had long COVID, which was a huge number uh, in that. Uh, women, as we saw in the previous slide, 50 to 60 year old middle aged women who are more prone. So women had a larger number compared to men. Men were about 33 percent and women were about 42 percent. Uh, age group, again, if you were more than 74, uh, more than 50 percent of the uh, patients in the age group of 74 and above uh, gave symptoms of long COVID. Uh, ethnicity, uh, again, a mixed number, but mostly reporting around 35 to 40 percent. Overweight, as you see, obese had the largest uh, percentage people reporting long COVID. Uh, index of multiple deprivation is a, a uniquely, uh, you know, UK index, which is uh, based on uh, seven factors, uh, income, employment, education, skills and training, health and disability, crime, barriers to housing services and living environment. These are the seven factors they include. And it's a post code based uh, uh, quintile. So uh, they have uh, one to 34,000 uh, index based on the post code you live in. And each post code has a separate index, but it's not uh, very quantitative so it doesn't mean that if you have a thousand index uh, you are half as developed as somebody with a 500 so it's not that but it's mostly quantitative but based on the postcode you live. so if you have a high index of multiple deprivation uh, you were uh, more prone to develop long covid so uh, in the least socioeconomic uh, developed communities we saw more long covid Smokers, of course, we saw more long COVID in this study. So uh, vaping, uh, smoking, both the same, uh, almost same incidences. So as we have been stressing for a long time, vaping is not really a safer option to smoking and it is visible in the long COVID as well. Severity of COVID symptoms, again, if you had more severe COVID symptoms and again, if you had uh, more comorbidities, these were again more prone to develop long COVID. So this is something that is now coming out with the data and we are seeing that uh, as in the previous slide we saw that if you had severe COVID, if you have comorbidities, if you are obese, uh, if you are old age, these are the risk factors for developing long COVID and we should be very careful uh, of these things when we are talking to our patients to understand exactly uh, what their symptoms are. 
So as we saw in the last slide, uh, the REACT study had about 40% of patients reporting uh, long COVID. And this is something that we are disregarding completely. It's a huge number, especially when you see the lakhs and lakhs of patients in our country like ours. If we have even, say, the lower end, 15% of patients suffering long COVID, that's a humongous number and we must take care of that. Uh, but it's difficult to diagnose, as I said, we even the GPs are not recognizing the symptoms. We are not really sure if it is long COVID or it is chronic fatigue syndrome or if it is anxiety or depression related to something because with COVID, many people have lost their businesses, many people have lost their jobs, many people have lost very close relatives. So it's all a mix of symptoms coming in especially the neurological symptoms are very hard to recognize and classify as long covid uh, but we, would we know that it is really affecting the productivity and the health especially the mental health uh, of people i have also uh, lost very close family members to post covid complications and long covid so we do understand that it is affecting uh, a lot of people and in various ways uh, including cardiological ways neurological ways gastrointestinal ways so but we do know that we can effectively manage these things if we address at least the symptoms and do some preventive screening to make sure that you know we prevent these long covid complications especially in the high risk uh, communities and so uh, individuals that we will uh, identify based on the factors that we saw in the last two slides. So uh, again, uh, we see that some pathophysiology is coming out. Uh, data is still a work in progress, but we see that if you have a particular autoantibodies, if you have a very high viral load, type 2 diabetes, of course, and uh, some uh, data coming out on reactivation of the EB virus uh, because most of us have EB virus uh, in the childhood and uh, then it stays latent of course and doesn't ever come back but uh, with COVID we are seeing that it may be reactivating the EB virus. Uh, sustained endotheliopathy is again one of the pathophysiologies that is coming in. Uh, contributing to long COVID pathogenesis, especially the cardiac effects and the neurological effects. And uh, for this, uh, uh, we were uh, seeing that some patients are being treated uh, with anticoagulants, antiplatelet therapies to prevent these complications. And uh, South Africa, there is a study that has uh, released which shows that there is some effectiveness to this uh, treatment regime. So again, to reinforce uh, what are the symptoms of long COVID, which you may uh, not recognize very clearly if a patient is coming out. So you may say that these are like, you know, you have uh, fatigue or common cold, but these are the very clear symptoms. And if anybody is coming to us with these symptoms, we must ask them their history of COVID infection, exactly what happened. So fatigue, loss of smell, persistent cough, shortness of breath palpitations uh, these are mostly related to uh, and chest pain mostly related to the heart and circular respiratory system uh, headache uh, brain fogging loss of memory forgetfulness depression these are mostly related to the neurological ones muscle pains pins and needles joint pains rash if you see the musculoskeletal system diarrhea abdominal pain uh, mostly related to gastrointestinal and then recurrent fever or persistent fever uh, which is an overall symptom that we see uh, in a large number of patients so if you have any patient coming with this please do uh, think of long covid as a diagnosis rather than uh, just treating them symptomatically so what will we do on step one? Uh, first of all, of course, we will gather the information from the screener, uh, from the citizen via the screener. So uh, before you come in, so first of all, we will say that are you normal completely or are you having any uh, symptoms? How much percentage do you feel? Are you okay? Uh, then if there are symptoms persistent, then we will ask them the previous history on severity of disease, hospitalization, 
whether you were ventilated uh, whether you were vaccinated before the disease or have you been vaccinated now uh, what are the comorbidities that are present and then the screener will ask them do you need to talk to a step one doctor uh, if there is a need to uh, talk to the doctor then we will uh, escalate the call to the doctor uh, when you do assess the patient then of course we need to see two things one is if there are mild symptoms uh, where, where you feel that examination and diagnostics are not required like it's if you see if you feel it's a, a fatigue happening or uh, you know mild memory loss or if you feel that there is a fever which is persisting which is 99 99.5 uh, then you can prescribe rest proper nutrition good diet uh, OTC medication like a paracetamol etc, uh, supplements, uh, multivitamins etc, mental health counseling if they have uh, mild memory loss or mild depression. Uh, tell them to avoid strenuous exercise till the time all these symptoms go away because we've seen uh, many cases of post COVID MI happening when you go for a strenuous exercise too soon after the infection. Uh, prescription you write the patient as and when required if particularly if you're prescribing low dose steroids for a persistent cuff uh, for example and uh, indicate when to follow up so a week or three days or five days or 10 days or 15 days when do we need to follow up the patient to see whether he has improved or not so at that time we will initiate another call but if you are seeing moderate or severe symptoms like severe chest pain or chest discomfort or uh, you know severe palpitation or patient is completely brain fogged can't remember anything then uh, please do uh, refer the patient uh, to a physician to his or her physician and do write the referral that the patient needs to see a doctor and these are the tests that the patient needs to do uh, the test will uh, just let you know in the next slide. So these are the tests that uh, we need to consider based on uh, what the symptoms are. Uh, if you feel that there is a severe fatigue and you feel that you know anemia may be a cause of blood count, dyselectrolyte or dyselectrolemia or renal insufficiency, we need to may need to do electrolytes and renal function tests, uh, iron studies. Uh, metabolic panel urine analysis to rule out all these symptoms uh, lfts for liver functions inflammatory markers like crp esr and ferritin uh, in case if fever is persisting or severe um, you know uh, breathlessness is persisting or chest pain is persisting thyroid function test we may need to do we may need to do a vitamin d vitamin b12 uh, to address uh, vitamin deficiencies we may need to do a D-dimer fibrinogen to un understand if the patient is having any coagulation disorders or a high risk for further clotting. And we may need to do some cardiac tests like ECG, Holter, stress echo, or as even a CT angiogram. If we do feel that, you know, patient is having recurrent chest pain, breathlessness on exertion, angina on exertion, or severe inappropriate sinus tachycardia. So if these are the things, we may need to do all these tests and we can write the tests in the disposition and refer the patient uh, to a physician after that. <clears throat> so thank you very much uh, for volunteering again. Uh, you all are wonderful, wonderful people, very kind, who have been devoting so much time to uh, addressing the problems of our communities, especially in these COVID dark times. So you are truly superheroes and we really thank you from the bottom of our hearts and happy to take any questions that you may have. Wow, Suchin, thank you. Um, we we'll wait and see if there are any questions from anybody. Uh, I was noticing that there was a slight delay in terms of what was showing on our screen and what was showing on YouTube. Um, a little bit of a lag. Issue, I think, here. Yeah. Yeah. Something yeah. It wasn't. It wasn't uh, live at the same time exactly. Uh, so far, there are no questions. Uh, we have about forty people uh, online right now that are part of uh, uh, on the YouTube channel. Uh, happy to take any questions from anybody at all.
so as you said sachin uh, what was the, what was the dialogue that you made during the last uh, session that we did uh, if there are no questions uh, there was a ha huh, what was it i can remember i cannot quote you verbatim yeah if there are no questions then the audience is either completely befuddled or completely bedazzled okay. we always hope that you are all bedazzled with us but uh, seeing both of us as gray as we are it's a uh, you know wishful thinking but yeah let's hope so so okay if there are no questions then i think uh, uh, that's it from our side thank you once again for coming in on a sunday morning we do have some spare time if you want to discuss anything else any logistics any jokes any fun games uh i also wanted to let you know that tomorrow onwards we'll actually be starting the screening of uh, people that have been um, uh, f- four weeks from the from the date of diagnosis and we'll have a dedicated set of volunteers um, uh, that will be doing this on a full time basis we hope that um, uh, as we start to, uh, to screen people we'll also get a better understanding in terms of patterns that are emerging uh with our demographic uh, uh, interventions that are being effective and and perhaps we will start some additional services as well such as support groups to have people from uh, long covid to kind of be able to share their stories and so on and so forth so this is unfolding uh, as you know with step 1 uh, you know we are a very dynamic organization um, we clearly recognize that there was a need and um, uh, hopefully this long covid program will will uh, evolve over a period of time to be able to uh, provide access to anybody in the country not just the governments that we work with but to anybody in the country including some of the employers we are working with some employers as well that have a high number of people who are experiencing uh, long covid so we are in talks with them as well uh, to launch the services so multiple avenues by means of which we hope our reach will increase and we reduce the burden of this morbidity associated with long covid uh there'll be a separate training session that will be held for you um, you know either we'll do a live training or we'll do it uh, via video uh, for all those that that are interested in in participating um uh, in specifically in in long covid um, uh, counseling and and consultation uh there's one question that has emerged uh, uh, uh suchin it's from uh, ambika prasad khare if we feel that appetite is not proper what should we be doing so uh for appetite we do have some appetite stimulants uh, you can prescribe any enzyme uh, syrups uh, they are very freely available uh, longifene is uh, another medicine that we can prescribe especially if you feel that the patient is diabetic and most of the other appetite stimulant syrups are sugar based Uh, longifene is one that is uh, completely sugar free so uh, that is a compound of medicine that we can prescribe but mostly uh, i think uh, willingness to exercise do some physical work uh, mild uh, you know uh, kinds of exercises even at home if they are not willing to go out and uh, some uh, mood uplifter uh, exercises these are things that work very well for appetite stimulation uh, but of course uh, uh, if you do need to prescribe some medicines these are some of the syrups and uh, uh, tablets available there's another question uh, suchin with respects to uh, long term dry cough and uh, particularly after this wave i'm seeing that you know almost two out of five people are reporting chronic cough that is not subsiding no matter what they do steam inhalation nothing seems to work what are your thoughts on that management of that so we've seen a lot of patients with chronic persistent cough uh, one thing that i have seen very clearly is uh, there's a much more uh, correlation with uh, antihypertensives than earlier so if please do find out if your patient has been taking any ace inhibitors or uh, angiotensin receptor blockers because even if they were not having uh cough before that on these medicines if after covid they will definitely develop because of the bradykinins so if they are please stop that medicines most of the patients will be recovered after that but if they are not on any antihypertensives and uh, they are just having this persistent cough uh, then 
uh, emoluments like uh, honey work very well by which i have seen so uh, you do get uh, cough syrups also with honey ayurvedic cough syrups you can try that uh, in very severe or persistent cases a short course of low dose steroids also works so for that of course you will write a prescription but first of all try to work with uh, these two things one is very common uh, correlation with as and arbs please stop those medicines if they are there give some anti allergics and the cough will disappear in 4 5 days uh, give some uh, honey based uh, emollients and if then it doesn't work then a short course of steroids at low doses uh suchin uh, from dr abiruchi there's a question of the use of uh, ecosprin particularly after this variant so aspirin anyways i think is a magic drug right it it works very well for multiple factors so unless and until there is complete contraindication to aspirin i don't think it's harmful especially as we've said in high risk individuals who are obese who are old age who have family history of heart disease who are hypertensives so all these people i think aspirin is something that we can give very safely to them uh, because of the fact that we are now at gb pan there is a study going on and they have more than 3000 post covid mi patients here uh, wow. that they've taken up and they are trying to study the correlation between covid as i told you also sanjeev earlier we have had very close family having had um, uh post covid mis so i don't think there is any harm in it um, especially in high risk individuals so males above 40 uh with family history of uh, heart disease or diabetes or obesity or high risk behavior like smoking um, or stressful jobs these are the people i think uh, i would prescribe aspirin to uh, proactively Thank you, Sachin. Uh, totally concur with you. Uh, wonder drug with very, very little side effects. Um, um, I'm sure both of us are taking aspirin at this point in time. Anyways, uh, there's a question not related to long COVID or management of symptoms, but uh, with respect to the vaccination. When should the booster dose be taken if you're double vaccinated, double vaccinated, and develop COVID before you took the booster? So the government says you have to wait for ninety days, uh, but there is uh, some uh, confusion regarding a notification which said thirty days also. Uh, so, but we would stick with the main government notification that came in that please wait for ninety days once you've had an infection. Cool. I think we've covered all the questions. I have a question, uh, Suchin. I've been uh, hearing, and I know a couple of patients who've uh, now been declared diabetics uh, post COVID, uh, not obese, reasonable BMI. What are your thoughts on uh, the emergence of diabetes secondary to COVID? Post COVID diabetes, I think, is very common now. So it has multiple factors. See, uh, COVID itself is a very stressful situation. so any stress will lead to more cortisols coming out and increasing your chances for diabetes second uh, uh, is the rampant use of steroids in covid so that also leads to iatrogenic diabetes and the third is of course uh, your family history is you are prone to diabetes and with any stress coming in just become diabetic uh, at that point of time uh, or you do get Uh, some tests done during uh, your covid and post covid uh, which makes you detected diabetes because we know that less than 10% of diabetes diabetics in india are actually diagnosed diabetic so there's a wide wide range of uh, uh, pre diabetics and early diabetics who have no diagnosis at all so these are some of the factors that we are seeing but it's mostly due to uh, the covid stress induced diabetes okay Okay. Thank you. Uh, follow up question on the aspirin uh, duration of taking aspirin. I know the answer, but please go ahead. No, no, you give the answer. No, no, no. That's just my thought. Indefinitely. <laughs> that's exactly my answer as well. So as I said, it's a magic drug. So there is no harm in it actually. If you are, especially if you are uh, high risk, so you know it prevents colon cancer. It prevents heart disease. It prevents Uh, you know mental cognitive decline 
so many good uh, effects about it so unless and until there are clear cut contraindications i don't think aspirin is something that we should stop there's a comment from dr monica bhagat um, uh, she has just added cough syrup for the cough she has uh, indicated uh, cough suppressant syrup uh, honitus syrup strepsils lozenges steroid nasal sprays and for post nasal drip and uh, monter anti histamine similar to what what you said right so um i i don't know why there are no questions i was i was thinking that with the mystery of long covid there would be hundreds of questions and you know we probably wouldn't have answers for most of them as well uh, since we are all finding out but it doesn't appear that there are too many um, uh, any more questions that have um, uh, kind of uh, come forward okay thank you i think it's a lazy sunday because the sun is out after many many you know days of uh very very dark weather here so people are just lazing around in the sun and having fun i think so it's good before we go sachin what are your thoughts on um, where are we at with respect to this pandemic is this the light at the end of the tunnel uh, is there another wave that's going to come hopefully not sanjeev but uh, as we know covid has proven the even the top scientists very very wrong most of the times and so it's very very dangerous to make a prediction but i hope that uh, this is the beginning of the new normal uh, even if some waves do come in i think uh, uh, there won't be so much of uh, government reaction and lockdowns happening as had happened in the first and the second waves as we've already seen in the third one that uh, people have started taking it lightly so i think it will depend on the severity of disease of the virus hopefully we won't get a more severe version now so let's hope that this virus has now started becoming the common cold of the next century so that's what we are hoping for okay all right um vishal has there been any other questions after the last one that i just asked or should we kind of wrap up no more questions oh there's one more question role of uh, tadalafil in long covid uh i'm not very sure again sanjeev as we said we are not very clear on uh, uh, there are no protocols as such there are no guidelines but uh, exactly for what symptom are you trying to not specified but there is another question that has emerged in terms of fatigue 14 year old child with fatigue how to deal with kids of 14 year old fatigue post uh, omicron infection so we've seen a lot of that and uh, especially in children what we saw as the main symptom of covid not just long covid was fatigue only so you know we had parents coming to us with that you know he's lazy he's not going to school he's not attending online classes and then you know we tested for covid and the patient the child was covid positive and the only symptom was i just don't want to wake up i want to sleep i'm very tired no fever nothing else uh, so uh, the best thing to do is to start a very healthy food regimen unfortunately most of these kids are uh, addicted to snacks and um, fried foods and high carb food so start a healthy food supplement give multivitamins bioperin and curcumin uh, supplements work really well which we've seen uh, these are some of uh, and start a mild exercise program uh, moving around so these are the things that help a lot in managing fatigue in especially younger adults and children Uh, Naresh has asked a question. Oh, the Tadafil uh, question was with, with, with respect to cardiovascular symptoms. Yeah, so I mean, see, we can try that. It it will be a nitric oxide releaser. It can help in these things, but uh, I haven't prescribed it yet. Uh, I don't know. I've I haven't seen any data on it yet as well. Are there any papers, Sanjeev, that you've seen? I haven't stumbled so, upon. I haven't stumbled upon anything. Yeah. So we'll come back to you on that. We'll we'll research a bit more. We don't have it in our protocols. We I have never prescribed it myself yet. Uh, but uh, we will. Uh, can you note down who the question is from? We can maybe get back to them quickly. Yeah, uh, maybe by before the end of the day, we'll definitely come back to you with some data and how. Uh, 
can you write a bit more on if you've prescribed it or if you've heard any cases uh, we would love to know more about it actually can you take them on the show not possible right no not possible um maybe that maybe he'll uh, it's narish sood maybe he'll add a little bit more but there is a couple of other questions that have emerged uh, one is with respects to uh, the thought process about getting a complete health checkup you know the routine health checkup uh, after long after covid your comments routine health checkups again i think are over uh, rated so it's better always to you know talk to your step one doctor or any other physician and and give the symptoms and understand exactly what tests you need um these executive health checkups and routine health checkups are actually advertisement driven uh, tests that are pushed by laboratories i have very little faith in them so i don't usually prescribe this to anybody but if you are having symptoms then of course you should get tested based on exactly what the issue is and i think your doctor can best prescribe what tests to get done rather than just going whole hog um, i've seen this a lot with patients now especially you know they just go and get each and every test done and then they have this uh, 100 page report and they want to see the doctor and ask him see what the reports are saying it is <laughs> uh, something that's a recent phenomenon but i don't really you know. you forgot to add that you know the ranges that are there and they see one abnormality there's a whole bunch of anxiety associated with the fact that the range is slightly it's it, the actual result is slightly off of the range which you know more often than not doesn't mean anything there's another question uh, with respect to uh, gi problems uh, particularly with per- persisting irregular bowel habits post covid what to advise yeah we've seen a lot of that so as i said pain abdomen irregular bowel habits you know persistent nausea lot of that so in this uh, high fiber diet works very well so uh, try to tell them to avoid oily foods fried foods eating out for some time and have a very high fiber diet if they can't have the high fiber diet then simple uh, fiber like isab gol etc works very well uh, uh, try to avoid milk Uh, for some days because most of indians are lactose intolerant and we don't realize that but the symptoms are exacerbated when you are suffering from a disease so uh, try to do that uh, try to avoid coffee and any other uh, you know spicy foods etc that increase your acidity levels uh, just diet and exercise is the main thing and you can supplement it with simple things like a, a, a rabiprazole tablet a domperidon tablet and uh, anti spasmodic sos and uh, isab gol etc these are the things that do work but do tell the patient that it will take some time uh, for them to be okay but if they start exercising uh, routinely and follow a good diet pattern uh, then the symptoms will get better they may not completely disappear but they'll definitely get better uh suchin so uh, naresh came back and he said uh, there was some study he doesn't remember the details but he have u- he has used it for hypotensives with tachycardia and it actually helped the patient improved yeah. wonderful great yeah we would love to find more about that i have not seen that study but i'll definitely read about it and come back yeah um uh, naresh if you if you do stumble upon the study we'll look for it as well but if you do stumble upon the study please do share it with us yeah we we love to be informed about it yeah, uh write your phone number uh, naresh we would have the number right uh, we would have the number already but if you can write it down we'll definitely get back to you anecdotal he's saying it's an anecdotal um, uh, study that was published okay. um one one more one more question with respects to symptoms from uh, manisha kukreja um i'm a little bit confused about the question but it says excessive sleep insomnia so i think i think basically both sleep disorders Yeah so again neurological disorders as i said especially seen in children early on when you know we had these multiple patients coming in and that is how we tied it to covid because you know a flood of patients suddenly coming in the child doesn't want to wake up and you know he doesn't want to attend his class he's lazy this that and then we found out so uh, fatigue leading to excessive sleeping is something that we've seen insomnia definitely a very predominant symptom Uh, and tied a lot to the anxiety around the disease 
and as i said anxiety around not just to your own disease but to the community to your loved one somebody's lost a loved one somebody's lost their job somebody's business has run aground so a lot of anxiety leading to insomnia uh, if there is insomnia then uh, i try a lot of natural things uh, and they seem to work very well so uh, if you uh, have a patient who has a hot uh, who has a tub at home just tell them to fill it with hot water and some salt and lie down in it uh, at bedtime about half an hour before and just completely relax and then come out dry themselves and go to sleep it helps a lot uh, most of the patients won't have that so tell them to fill a small tub of water and soak their feet at least in it uh, uh, with salt so what happens is Uh, the blood flow starts going towards uh, the area where you are putting in hot water and drains out from your brain and leads to some sort of uh, relaxation in the brain and this helps a lot in the sleep pattern uh, you can prescribe a small uh, you know sedative as well but what we've seen is then it's very habit forming and people start taking it popping it on their own uh, but uh, uh, simple things like uh, exercise in the morning Uh, avoiding tea coffee etc after 6 pm having a warm bath or a warm uh, foot soak uh, uh, about half an hour before bedtime avoiding appliances mobile phones televisions etc in the bedroom and going to the bedroom just to sleep not do anything else uh, these are some of the uh, simple habit uh, habits that your patients can develop to take care of the insomnia around it but if you do find on deeper probing that there is a severe anxiety issue around it or patient has some uh, you know stories to tell or you know there is something so then prescribing an anti anxiety and a mild sedative also works very well thank you i think that's it in terms of questions um, uh, i'd like to remind everybody that's listening please let's not forget that you know irrespective of whether there is another wave or not long covid is a reality and we don't know what the numbers are in india nobody is really looking at it in in a systemic fashion as uh, suchin had alluded to earlier on um you know this is uh, the, this journey that step 1 um, has taken on in terms of start it started with this pandemic we are very committed to it not just in terms of the waves ending but to ensure that people have kind of restored their health and are back to normal and we'll do whatever we can to try and assist citizens uh, particularly in this in this gray area of long covid uh, which nobody seems to understand right now and and possibly you know uh, down the road as we collect more data we may be able to embark on 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 some some kind of research as well uh, so let's not forget that uh, please continue to volunteer and as i had mentioned that uh, once we kind of incorporate all of the changes into fresh test most of most of you will be familiar there won't be much uh, there won't be much in terms of the technology that will change there'll be some additional data points that will be there and we'll guide you in, in terms of how to do that in digital training session uh, either through a live session or through a video will be shared with you um we had scheduled a little bit longer today we had thought that we may little, need a little bit longer there may be more questions since there was unknown associated with long covid but uh, i think uh, it's been about 3 minutes since the last question so we'll be wrapping up in an hour it's 11:29 so chin any final words of wisdom with respects to covid long covid or life in general so yeah i think uh, just reinforcing the fact that first of all diagnosis is necessary so if you are seeing any symptoms do you know think of long covid instead of uh, dismissing them off and as you know mild symptoms so do think of long covid and once the diagnosis in, is in place then we can of course work together Uh, do feel free to reach out for any clarifications any help needed or anything that you want to discuss about these patients uh, we are also learning on the job so uh, very happy to work with you and get some data in place get some findings together uh, look at other cases where we had similar symptoms share some knowledge and learnings i think it will take some time but we will definitely get uh, wiser um, in the next few months hopefully okay so chin uh, so i think you're starting your sunday evening in the afternoon right that's what happens 
no, no, that, that's at 1.30 or 2 p.m. So I'm starting work now. So I've pushed back work to talk to you today. So usually I talk to you at 2 o'clock. That is when my evening starts. Great. Okay. Well, it, thank you for making the time on, on a Sunday morning. And thank you all for having joined. Uh, um, uh, you know, it's a learning experience for us. We look forward to your continued participation. And uh, let's not just conquer pandemic, but let's also overcome long COVID. Have a great day all, a great rest of Sunday. And in advance, uh, valent happy Valentine's Day to everybody, which is tomorrow. Happy Valentine's. Bye-bye. Take Thank care, you. everybody.